148 or maybe it's 149. You'll guess right now and leave a comment for us. And uh, this episode is going to be how to everything proof your business with what's going on in this real estate market. And we're going to get started maybe right now. Well, this is off to a great start. <laughs> Headphone DJs. Nice. I did that yeah. on the cruise ship. I actually, I am such a dude that is, damn it. Jeez. Jesse God. just jumped right to him. Like, he doesn't. I, I felt like this the about the new, uh, the new Top Gun movie is the same way I felt about DJ headphone. What they're called? The song called Silent DJs. Silent DJs. Silent they DJs. had that in like, New York, yeah. I wanted to hate it, and it was pretty badass. It looked cool. Like, looked cool. I kind of wanted to think the new Ooh. Top Gun was going to be so lame, and I went, and I was like, this is pretty kick-ass dude yeah like, it's so good we were <laughs> we were somebody's not super stoked about dancing in front of other people the idea of dancing while the room's silent and i can hear the music is terrifying it, kind of but at the same time it's more it's more so like when you walk up and you see all these people and they're just moving around and it's dead silent that's the part yeah. i don't want it yes anybody but, to but when you're in it either. when you're in it like we were with addy um, and we were walking around the city. It was like 9, 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. And she wanted to go to Times Square. Okay. And Heather's brother's like, absolutely not. So we still went. He's like, this is the last time. I'm not taking any more family members to Times Square. You know, you know, when you're in New York for oh, so dude. long, yeah, you're you not going so to where all the tourists yeah. are. And so you, she, you could tell. We're like, how do you want to go and put these headphones on? It's free to, you know, it's yeah. free. And she's like, eh. You could tell she really wanted to go do it, but yeah. she just she was on a mission to get to Times Square. A hundred percent. That's fair. <laughs> so, all right, episode one forty eight or one forty nine. Um, it's one of those two. Um, leave us a great review on one of those episodes. But uh, today's show is brought to you by our favorite sponsors, and they sponsor all of the one forty nine episodes that we've had. It's the Ron with Armadillo Home Warranty. So go to armadillo.one backslash tour, T-O-R-E. If you're looking for the new age, the 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 newest of the best and the best of the best when it comes to home warranties, talk to Theron Smith and uh, see what he can do for you. And then um, go over to Mortgage Mike while you're getting that home warranty and say, hey, I want to get a loan with you, Mortgage Mike. I want that Mortgage Mike stamp of approval. Mortgage and uh, mortgagemikeoftexas.com. I heard that mortgagemikeoftexas.com, I don't know if he's listening, but he told me he was getting a revamp. We're going to get some more info on there, some more cool stuff. So definitely check out mortgagemikeoftexas.com in the future when it gets redone. Last but not least, property management. Everyone loves a property manager. 100%. Everyone loves a good, it. A good, good property a manager. A good, oh, a great property manager. Everyone wants that. Right? They don't want no shit property manager. They don't want to do There's just approve every tenant that comes exactly. in who doesn't pay their bills. Fortunately, that's what you usually get. Yeah, yes. and they don't answer their phone ever, right? So HomewardDFW.com doesn't do that. So look, you need a good property management, HomewardDFW.com. Go uh, talk to Dana, and uh, you'll be impressed. Trust me. Yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. Do it. Facebook user. Yes. Said it correctly. So I'm assuming Facebook user is... The Ron. Is the. that a thing with StreamYard? Do we yeah, they not? need to go. I don't know they need is. to go click on it. It is. It it's is. only him too. That's what I don't understand. I yeah. like that it it hides your identity by calling you Facebook user, but it still goes to the trouble of putting up a blank avatar just <laughs> yeah. as your picture. It's like, why do you even put that? It's like the old egg on tweeters. Yeah, exactly. So look, this episode is talking about. We were going to do the top five ways to everything proof your business and. Normally, let's be real. Do we ever get to the five on our list? No. So, we make no effort to talk about five before the show. Yeah. We just talk. So. No, because look, it's probably going to be five, though. And it needs to happen. This needs to happen because we were going to call it back to the basics, and no one wants that. No. Right. And, you know, there was, a, there was an article that just came out. Redfin released this. Um, Redfin, Redfin released it just, uh, I think, a couple of days ago saying that. Uh, the cancellation rate of contracts in June has been the highest it's been since 2008. Yeah, 14 percent. Yeah, 14 percent. And then sometime in 2008, there was like a, it was like a 17 percent cancellation yeah. rate. Right. So we're not that far behind, and we're we're definitely seeing agents reaching out in that freakout mode. Like, hey, I got a listing, 
and then no no showings no are showings happening, no offers, offers are happening. The sellers are getting upset, and you know it's it's this is the time to start figuring out how to start educating the consumers mm -hmm. about what's going on in the marketplace. And I'll share a little bit of what we talked about in our team meeting. But what are you what are you guys seeing right now? Within within all this, are you seeing the cancellation rates as well? Terminations. Yeah, we've had a few. Yeah. I, I, I do think it is important to clarify. This is what I you know is what I love about the news is the lack of context, right? Um, I am in no way trying to say that there's not a massive shift happening right now because there is. We're feeling it and, and we're reacting to it. And we're taking advantage of the opportunities as they manifest themselves. And you understand what the the big difference between cancellations of contracts at the rate that they're at right now as opposed to 2008 as opposed to 2008 those were canceled because of financing because financing fell through more often than not or not more than yeah it's like right now what we're facing is more than anything what we're seeing is cancellations based on buyers who bought at the tail end of or went under contract at the tail end of the buying frenzy, so they didn't get very favorable terms. And now that inventory is picked up, when the sellers and them are negotiating repairs or things like that, or anything having to do with the escrow period, they're going, no, nah, I'm not agreeing to shit. The buyers have control now. I will just terminate and go find a different house that I can negotiate better terms on. So that's a really important distinction to make because in 2008, you weren't getting those deals back. The buyers that are terminating right now might be ter terminating for, you know, call it buyer remorse, but they're not remorseful over buying a home in general. They're remorseful because they, they had unfavorable terms locked in, probably because their agent didn't represent them super well and didn't, you know, wasn't an agent that had a lot of reps and didn't realize that the buyers had more leverage now. And now when we're getting into the escrow period and we're getting to our second negotiations, we're getting into possibly appraisal negotiations, right? We're, a lot of people uh, did guarantees and partial guarantees, right? You're having buyers go, no, I'd rather just lose my earnest money than come up with the money to make up this low appraisal. This is a joke. I'll just go find a different house. The inventory is three times what it used to be. Are we still seeing appraisal waivers? No, no, I, what I, I'm okay. saying is that the contracts that are terminating were locked in 30, you know, 25, you know, 21, 25 days ago, they might be just getting to the appraisal part yeah. now. And it might make sense to them to be like, I'm not coming up with 25,000 extra dollars. I'll just lose my 3,000 in earnest money and walk. It's funny though, because I'm having one of those real estate days full of problems, oh, right? Like I had a new construction that's been under contract since January of 2021 come in with a low appraisal. Yep. What? I don't even understand how that's freaking possible. Right. I have a listing that we have had under contract twice that has fallen out because of one of them. We actually met the buyer right where they were at. They were asking for for 10 grand in repair concessions. Yeah. We gave them the 10 grand. They're like, now nah, we're still going to walk. I'm like, what in the hell just happened? Oh, geez. Yeah. Right. Um, another listing that we've done a, a price reduction on, but it wasn't big enough to invigorate interest because we've had one showing since we did the price reduction eight days ago. Yeah. Right. It's like all of this stuff. And then and then I think one other thing that I can't even remember because it, it wasn't as big as those three. Yeah. But like. None of those problems were existing in the market that I was just working in for the past 18 months. There were other problems, but now deals in the transaction. Oh, the other one is uh, an HOA that won't freaking get like $500 more of crime insurance. So the lender may, you know what I mean? Like just oh, silly stuff. But my point being is like all of that, those were not problems I was dealing with for the past 18 months because it didn't matter what else came up. You just figure it out, yeah. right? Appraisals didn't matter. Financing didn't matter. You're, there is definitely an aspect of this that is going to up your game a little bit. You are going to have to become a better problem solver. Um, I found that in my 10 years of real estate, there's always going to be new problems I haven't seen yet, mm -hmm. right? And that never ends. You're going to get a lot more practice at solving the practical problems that come up during a real estate transaction than you have in the past 18, 24 months. And if you thought, look, if you thought 2020, 2021 was tough, they haven't dealt with this yet because that was a different, that was a different stress of, of emotions running high just because and, and the buyers quickly got on board right people did what it what it would take just to go buy a house yep. and this go around is you have sellers who are going to draw lines you're going to have buyers who are going to draw their lines and then there's it's trying to marry the two together is going to be super super tough especially um you know looking at the trend reports um we've we saw briefly, we'll see what happens for when July numbers come out, 
is that June, the average pre-owned sales price fell in, in for the North, North Texas. Texas North Texas. $5, yep. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of things. With that starting to fall, and we start seeing homes sit on the market, we start seeing some price adjustments happening. We're going to see buyers that are going to come in with lowball offers. We're going to see buyers that are wanting to wait, and they're going to give the, the objection that they want to wait till the bottom. And there's, at times, you can make the most compelling arguments against that. And they still will. No, I'm waiting to the bottom, Brian. I'm just going to wait, bro. I mean, we is this not the exact opposite situation we were just in with sellers? We had historically low inventory because every, all the sellers were like, nah, my house keeps getting worth more and more every single day. I'm just going to stay here. I'm rich now. We had the same objection just on the other side. Yeah. It's the exact I, same objection. I, I, I will say two things about the buyer who's waiting for the bottom of this thing to fall out. A, as a real estate agent, guard your time that you invest with somebody with that thought process. Yeah. Now, that is not saying don't objection handle, don't try and, and help them understand what's best for their situation. Not regurgitating what we say or whatever. Listen to what their situation is and trying to walk them through what's best for their situation. And you... you I think so many people get out of this business in, in these types of times. You know, I felt like we, we felt this in like 17 and 18, whenever that little dip was, right? Yeah. And, and we get towards the end of the year and what starts happening? Dues, that, those end of the year dues yeah. are like equivalent to what you pay for the whole rest of the year. And while we can look at real estate and we bitch in these forums and say, why are there so many real estate agents? Because the barrier to entry is too low. There are also a lot of real estate agents who look at that $500 or whatever your, your renewal amount is at the end of the year and be like, look, I ain't selling shit. I'm not really trying to. Yeah. I've got to somehow get through January and February. And if you've never felt that desert in real estate between October and February, it is a weird time to be in real estate if you're not the type of person who's used to having like lead generation and grinding in your business. And I think we're going to, I hope we see something a little bit more similar to that. And it seems like we're going to, but so many real estate agents, I feel like get out of this because they find incredible inefficiencies in their business and working with buyers who are the people who are waiting for the bottom of the market. I will tell you, that's not somebody I spend a ton of time on. I'm not going to sit there and try and convince somebody. If I, if I understand their situation and can help them, that's fine. But I don't have a lot of fun waiting for the, because you know what else that client's going to do? They're going to go out and pick apart every house and want to lowball off for every house. And then you get them under contract and they're going to want every damn thing in the whole house fixed. Every other problem that comes up, they're going to feel entitled yep. that that should come down on their side of the fence. And I just ain't got time for that shit anymore, man. Uh, and yeah, it, this, look, it's going to get, it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better mm -hmm. because we're, we're operating in that, that unknown realm at the moment you know inflation rates are still going up at the moment they feel like it's starting to they're starting to flip out about that today huh? right yeah. well if you look at some of it inflation increased because of of gas and energy costs yeah. and if you look at some of the other thing bacon prices actually dropped to yeah. two straight months yep. i did see nine dollars for organic milk yesterday like eight ninety nine for yeah. that horizon brand milk is up milk. like Jeez. yeah milk yep. is up like 14 percent you know, over the last 12 months. Drink water. Um, and Wait, milk's so good on my fruity pebbles, though, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> Especially <laughs> organic milk. Even though those fruity pebbles I, aren't organic. I like how he eats or, or, or drinks organic milk with fruity yes. pebbles. Balance, baby. Just that oil that comes off of the fruity <laughs> the, pebbles the is dude not that organic. orders two large pizzas and two liters of Diet Coke. <laughs> and you think, it's because I chug the milk afterwards yeah. and I want to taste go, like If you're going to go all pebbles. in on your shitty yeah. meal, don't do Diet Coke. <laughs> just yeah. get regular Coke. It is whole milk, though. Do you know? Oh, my God. Uh, do you know one thing that I was, uh, was thinking about yesterday? And this is kind of goes in line with how to everything proof your business is, you know, something that we talk about, especially on this show that we do here and, and we're sharing everything. Obviously we don't hide anything and right. say, we'll keep the best for us. Not for the, not for the not people for that listen to this is that collaboration over competition mindset. And as this market starts to tighten up and, and agents are, are losing deals and they're, they're worried about paying dues or they don't want to pay those dues because they don't have enough, they don't have money coming in or the right, right. amount of money coming in. Their mindset starts shifting into this 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 fear mindset, yeah. and what they do is they start looking at brokerages that yeah. may have a cheaper option, right? They look at the no cost or the transactional brokerages, yep. and they they then start running and going over there and saying, 
Don't Man, I'm going to leave. Doing podcasts? Yeah. Fucking I'm going to leave. People that listen to this show call you while you're doing the show. <laughs> then <laughs> I'm going to leave a brokerage that has top producing agents in the marketplace to go to some no name or to some cheaper option. Yeah. yeah. And who do you think you're you're rubbing elbows with over there? The same mindset, that same fear-based mindset. That scarcity mindset. The ones that aren't selling houses. And so, number one, to everything prove your business, it may be a time to look at brokerage options where, look, it may cost a little bit more or, or um, you know, it might be an 80-20 split. Darren, it might be I am set- so not joking about this. <laughs> 70-30 split. But, you know, <laughs> if you're able to go surround yourself with bigger thinkers and bigger producers that are that are coming from an abundant mindset – joining a real estate team or teams that are that are still producing in this market that is that it needs to be on the table because yeah. number one is this is when we're seeing a lot of people reaching out like they're like man i'm just gonna go they don't charge a monthly fee over here um and i just need to go over here because i'm trying to save as much money as i can and then they're not doing anything marketing wise they're not doing anything legion wise and they're just staying within that that kind of fear-based area man that really does i'm sorry to interrupt no go ahead man that is that is that it it feels so uh long ago now that like i i almost forgot that we did see a pretty significant dip in 2017 into early 2018 because that is what reminds me of that like I, I remember, like that's when a lot of the flat fee brokerages started to gather up a lot of agents. I, I actually forgot that the market got pretty tough in 2017 for a while. Like it was I, July, by the way, it was July. I know it was July because me and Denton had a listing on the same street, and everything it felt like changed in one day. Like we both were like, I had one in McKinney that it was in McKinney. Yes. It was in Stonebridge yep. Ranch. It was McKinney Stonebridge Ranch, mine too. Yeah, and 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 I had them under contract on a contingent offer to sell their home, and I thought no problem whatsoever. Didn't think anything of it. Never got either home sold. Like never got never got their home sold, so they never did the buy side. Like showing has just stopped. And, and I don't even, that was really just, that was just noise. That was just like people thought the market was going to crash, so they stopped buying homes. And yep. then like in 2018, we just picked right back up. But that's when a lot of the people went to the discount brokers. It was weird because that was when kind of the three of ours relationship yeah. grew quite a bit. And I remember learning so much from you guys from that, even about leading and lag- lagging indicators. I was an individual agent at the time, and I didn't really lead generate. I had paid for a crap load of internet leads. And I was pretty solid at converting them, but I had huge expenses. And I didn't really know real estate, right? Like I didn't, I didn't track anything. Like I didn't know any numbers. And it, it was through conversations with you guys and us just starting to do the show where I had started like, it may have been Seychelles Van Poole that was the first person I had ter- heard talk about days on market going up as kind of a leading indicator to other things happening. And like, I didn't even think about those things. And I was, it wasn't like I was new. I was like five and a half yeah. years into real estate yeah. and still kind of winging it from an understanding standpoint. And I do think that's one of the things that we all have to take our own personal accountability for when it comes to our career, whether you go to a flat free brokerage or whether you, you work for the most expensive brokerage, whether you're the biggest agent of your brokerage or you're barely hanging on by the skin of your teeth or you're brand new. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, I don't got it have been so good about not saying it. It's been a while. Day, been when, it co- when it comes to advancing your career, it is it is through collaboration, but it also, there is going to be a huge part of it just gonna fall on you educating yourself. I am so lucky that I stuck around as long as I did yeah. with as little knowledge as I had. But if you don't wanna take that path, I can tell you right now that educating yourself around things like what what you guys are talking about, you know, interest rates, not just the current ones, but what they look like historically so you can have conversations, what the market looks like historically so you can go in and give people peace of mind. It also, the more smart people are out there saying smart things, it slows down this bullshit frenzy. The more people yeah. are just informed, it's on the less us. they're inclined to act stupidly, yep. right? So That's, I just could, I mean, that I have been saying that forever and, and, and it could not be more true. Like the number one driver of exuberance in the real estate market whether it's irrational exuberance on the buying side so like everybody wants to buy a home or rational exuberance where nobody wants to buy a home and everybody's afraid of everything is real estate agents and the things that they say like we're the biggest proprietors are like we're the, the biggest uh uh like people that put forth doom and gloom because we want to be right for some weird perverse reason but to actually get to how to everything proof your business right so we've made it pretty clear right things i believe for 120 days are going to get relatively difficult for a lot of agents. And that's sad. I I hate to think that people are going to get out of the business. I just know that they are. Uh, And when they do, 
things tend to equalize. You know, this is this is right out of the book Shift by Gary Keller, which I actually think is a really phenomenal book. I don't I don't I don't, uh, I don't read all of that stuff, but but this one in particular I think is very 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 good. There's 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 going to be at the beginning of the shift you have as many agents as you had when it was in a good market but you have less available income per agent right and so that's when things get difficult and and you have to be lean and you have to really really work your ass off and then what happens is the fringe agents who are just kind of hanging on deal by deal over the course of three or four months they tend to fall off and get out of the business unfortunately because they can't hang on any longer they can't survive and so now you have fewer deals that are available fewer available or uh, a smaller amount of available income you also have a smaller amount of active agents whenever things normalize on either side of a shift you have agents that are selling about the exact same amount of homes per year it's just whether you're selling a uh, whether a lot of transactions are happening a year and you have a lot of agents or fewer transactions are happening per year and you have fewer agents per capita it always equals itself out it's just that literally shift from one extreme to the other and where where you have to really work your ass off and get real smart and get really lean because things get tough for everyone for a little while it's just whether or not you can weather that initial storm so how do you weather that initial storm here's the deal can you imagine if you were doing all of the things in the business that you always knew you should be doing, it's just you were forced to do it now. I have been preaching this to our team for months now. The game plan doesn't change when the market shifts. It's just your consistency and the intensity around the game plan and your execution of it has to go to another level. And by the way, that other level is really the level that it really should have always been at. I was going to say, know. they probably weren't yeah. actually. If you have a lot of agents. I mean, dude, I, I am guilty of this. I coast, man. It's been in a hell of a year. It's been a hell of a ride. I've been playing a little bit more golf than I usually What'd do. What we do this morning? Yes, and this morning, you know what we did? We got our asses back in here, and I was calling fucking expireds at 8 o'clock and having a blast, by the way. I forgot how much fun it is to prospect, dude. I, I did, It's too. fun, man. We, just... we, we've had this automation for a long time um, for the expired stuff, and, and I've been the one monitoring it, and very candidly, it had become, you know, like, you want to move to a brownstone, and then you live in a brownstone. You're like, oh, no, I live here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's like I really wanted all this automation that just brought me opportunities. Then eventually it just became clutter yeah. in my damn inbox because it wasn't something that I was actively working on. Yep. So we moved that over to another agent on the team. And I get an opportunity to call expires, which I'm not the greatest in the world at, but I'm pretty decent at it. Sure. And I have good conversations. Brian and I sat down this morning. By 8.03, we were on the phone. Didn't have plenty of tons of people to talk to today, which was weird. I'll get into that in a second because there were a ton of cancels, ton of but cancels. not many expires. I mean, yeah. a lot of people are fed up. Yeah. Um, but we we both had two great conversations with two separate people that I would one hundred percent not have had this morning had I still had the automation set up. And that, like, look, guys, if you've watched this show for any amount of time, I'm not the world's lead. Ge- These two guys can sit on the phone all day long and yeah. be really effective. I'm not the greatest lead generator. One, just because it's it's not something that I find enjoyable all the time. Sure. And so like. But getting in there today, Brian's right, man. There was some excitement to it. There were definitely nerves when those first when that first person picked up. I hadn't talked to somebody on the phone in a while. It might be hot at eight o'clock in the morning, but dude, it worked out pretty good. It worked out pretty good. A couple of callbacks. And so this is this is what you need to figure out, right? What, what you really should have figured out all along. What you really need to figure out now and take action around it. I've been preaching this in our group coaching sessions for a while now, right? Everybody wants to run a sphere based business, meaning it was it would be really amazing if you only worked with people that you know, like, and trust, or that know, like, and trust you, right? So you gotta figure out what that number is to hit your goals. So I I fundamentally believe, and I I would like your opinion on this, but I I believe in the the 12 and two model. I I fundamentally believe that, and I've seen it in our business work, that for every 12 people that that are solid people in your database that you have a good relationship with, I define them as A's and B's, and, and A's are people that would bail you out of jail, B's are the people that it wouldn't be weird to have lunch with. Um, for every 12 of those, they should be good for two deals a year, either through themselves personally or through a referral, right? So what you need to do is you need to figure out your number. So you take the amount of people that you need in your database to hit your goals. So if I wanna sell 50 homes a year, I would need 300 A's and B's in my database. Then you get realistic about where you're currently at, and then you get realistic about what you need to do to close the gap. And then every day, your lead generation is simply focused on two day, two things. It is nurturing the existing A's and B's in your database so that you get that 12 and two. And it is prospecting so that you, you close the gap, right? The majority of people that are in my database now 
are people that I met through prospecting years ago, right? And so all you're doing is now closing the gap. And so when you're sitting around going like, what do I do all day? First, know your numbers, then figure out a system for nurturing the people that are already in your database. And then, guys, there are millions of people in your local market, pretty much everywhere. Pick up the phone and talk to them, right? Whether it is online leads, circle prospecting, open house follow-up, expireds, FISBOs, whatever. I had the same story from calling expireds this morning. I, 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 I dialed for 45 minutes before I had to do power-up. I had two very solid conversations with people that I, I'm following up with that I got full contact information from and agreed upon follow-up. Now it is my job to do what I said I was going to do and actually follow up with them. Whether or not I get something from that, guess what? Yeah, I only called for 45 minutes. That's, that's, that's two people in 45 minutes. Imagine if I focused for three hours a day, which by the way, isn't difficult. Go work in corporate America. They'll want you to focus for eight hours a day. If I just focused for three hours a day, okay, that would be six solid nurtures every single day. And by the way, I'm going to have good days too, where I just get straight up appointments and go kick ass, right? But if I just had those six and I worked 48 weeks a year, so I took four week long vacations and I worked only five days a week, that would be 1,440 solid nurtures for my prospecting efforts outside of the business that I already get from my sphere every single year. If I only closed at a 2% rate, I would be selling 72 houses a year. Just don't, don't come at me with this bullshit about a shift like that's your problem. It's just not. Shift is an opportunity to reveal what you should have been doing in your business all along. And if you start doing it now, bro, there is way more than, a, than the, the, the available amount of income in the market right now is more than you could ever spend in a lifetime. You just got to go out and get it. And your competition is going to be diminished here pretty soon. So start putting those habits in place. Know your number, know where you're currently at, know your gap, and then just fill it, man. Fill that gap. It's not kind of dirty, but you know yeah. what I mean. Let like me, that's what you. Let need. me let me ask you a question. Where do you think the number one problem is that we'll just, in general, real estate agents have the number one problem? Um, I would say lack of confidence. Okay. Other than lack of confidence, so in terms of oh their organization, business, yeah, yeah, okay, perfect. Yeah. So so the number one problem that that we've we've seen overall. And I mean, the years that we've been doing this, I've been doing it since 05, yeah. is everyone's attracted to the shiny object, which means Kelderman's, Kelderman's probably the perfect example of this, is that he was buying leads off Realtor.com when sure. we first started this show. And when you go ask him about it, he was doing well in his mind because he had closed a huge, huge deal and his ROI yeah. was there off of really one major closing. Right. And then you go ask him, if we really dove into it, I say, Matt, how many times did you reach out to the leads that came into Realtor.com? How many times did you reach out? There was no system, so it was sporadic at best, but yeah. a couple. A couple times. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let me, let me, there's two things I want to, I want to go over, right? Number one, there's a, there's a book by, he's, he's one of my coaches called Coach Burt. Coach Burt. Million dollar follow-up, right? He says agents and business owners in general are leaving millions of dollars on the table, by lack of follow-up, yeah. right? And lack of follow-up meaning, why, are, would you, why would you call somebody one time? If you're gonna do the initial effort to lead generate, if you're gonna do the initial effort to even work your database and your sphere, people that know, like, trust, and love you, and they say, not right now, Brian. Why are you not calling them and, and providing something of value sure. in your follow-up? And so something that, something that it talks about is that it typically takes seven to 15 touches to get to convert about 80% of people in your database. Yeah, I've always heard like 7 to 12%, 7 to 15%, yeah. Right? And the way times, that yeah. the way that it goes is let me see if it's in in this one and if not, I will go to the next one. Um, is there there's a breakdown in the percentage of people that um, the people that need to see something, right? So if you're having a conversation uh, around selling or buying a home right now, the conversation comes down to to this. It goes down to um, the person that sees it first, right? Is called the the innovators. That's yeah. two and a half percent of the population. Yeah, so you have like your innovators, your early your early adopters, early adopters need to see it one to three times to take action, and that's thirteen and a half percent of the population. So that's what is that? That's sixteen percent. Yeah. Then you've got the early majority, majority which yeah. is thirty four percent of the population 
and they need to see something three to seven times. And then you've got the late majority, which is seven to 15 times. So that equals roughly about 80, 80 to 84%. Um, to, so that needs to see something between seven to 15 times in total before they take action. And then you've got the people that I think most people follow up with or spend too much time on, what they call the laggards. laggards yeah. And that's people that are never, ever, ever going to take action. It's a bell curve. Right, and so from that, how many times have you have you talked to agents? They're like, "Man, I had a great conversation with this person," and I'm like, "Oh, tell me about it." Well, they've lived in the house for 30 years. Yeah. I mean, and they just told me everything about this house. They they their kids are now moved out. Um, it's just it's just them and their their spouse, and but they're not going to do anything until probably somebody passes away. You know, like- uh, Cool, you just talked to your aunt. <laughs> Good fucking job. Yes. So if 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 we break it down into to understanding seven to fifteen touches yep. and we have that visually, then the way that I like to do things and, and Brian Brian's spot on, I'm gonna tell you hundred percent, go back and listen to that. There's times when when, you know, my high D personality, I'm like, I'm hearing all that, I'm like, nope, nope, <laughs> nope. But Visually, I like simplicity. Yeah. So just seven to fifteen touches. That's it. Yeah. That's going to get eighty percent, right? The, there's a law of numbers. Yep. So if I need to provide seven to fifteen per, uh, fifteen touches of something valuable, let's start creating something valuable. What would that be? Client appreciation events. Sure. Right. What kind of webinars could you be doing right now? Ooh, that you could get your database. The webinar on? game is such an interesting space now. I don't want to say thank you, COVID. That's so morbid, but man, QR codes and webinars. Oh, COVID, a great debt of gratitude. Gratitude. QR. You talk about early adopters. You could have thrown a stone and not been able to hit a person in Times Square that knew what a QR code was in 2019 because it was a dying technology. Now we use them every day. Webinars would be awesome. Right. And I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of ways to leverage that in your life because I will tell you, sometimes I hear stuff like Nick's like, um, Nick's like client appreciation events. I will tell you the average agent is going to go to, oh, I've got money to spend on it. And I will, I will say there are ways to do it very affordably. The webinar thing is great, not just because you have free resources to get the information out to everybody. There's lots of stuff to talk about. You want to know what to do a webinar about? Google real estate news and then do a webinar about the, the, the stuff that you see the most. It's going to be on interest rates. It's going to be around rising home price. It's going to be about yeah. all the money stuff around this. Have a lender come on that you know and trust who is articulate and come on and discuss that. So stuff. just ask. That's really actually, uh, I bring this up because did I not text you and Mortgage Mike? Literally yesterday. Was it yesterday or the day I before? I said, hey, what kind of webinars could we put on with Mortgage Mike? that is it's twofold we can go direct to consumers right and agents can pop on because yes. what i'm what i'm having troubles with or what i'm seeing the the problem in the marketplace is real estate agents and and real estate agents are doing a disservice to loan officers yeah right and so i brought this up on my team call yesterday where you know every lending company has different rates Yes. And so let's say that Mortgage Mike is is competing against someone else. And let's say Mortgage Mike rate is a little bit higher okay. than the other company. Okay. In a real estate agent's mind, they're like, well, you need to go with the, we need to get you the lowest rate. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you a question. If you're, if you're a real estate agent and you send a client to a, a loan officer and that loan officer is like, hey, Kelderman, you know, Brian's, Brian's charging you a lot of commission. I know someone who can do it for less. Yeah. How would that make you feel as a real estate agent? Whoa, agents? that's super true. Well, no, 100%. Yeah, if, if that's happening to your preferred partners, especially people that, like, you are having, you're, you do business with, that's When that's it's not terrible. even do business, we need to, we need to protect our, our clients, too. There's a certain thing with fiduciary. I don't know if fiduciary technically 100% falls under the lending guidelines. Right. Right? But... Right now, we, we're seeing a lot of mortgage companies closing up shop in the middle. And y'all talked about it, I'm sure, last week, right? Dude, when, Loan Depot uh, just basically closed their whole purchase division. They load, laid off 4,800 4, people. 4, you would have totally been able to convince me that only like 300 people even worked at Loan Depot. I didn't know they were so big. No, they're huge. 4,800 yeah. people. Was it Spruce Mortgage? Woo! That went out of business overnight. Went out of business last yeah. week, yeah. right? There are people that are that are going and getting because it's the cheapest loans because these companies are just trying to attract them in. They're doing everything they can to keep the doors open. Is that because these lenders are just not like 
So talk about why that is happening a little bit, because I think even I only understand the edges of it, and, and I, I'm sure there's a lot of real estate agents who don't understand why that's why that would happen to a lender. Well, first off, lenders lenders hired a lot during COVID, yeah. right? The, the refinance boom, they had to, if you remember during the refinance boom, if you had any clients complaining, or you re, I refied during that time, and it took forever because they, it was it was clogging up their pipelines, it was clogging up purchase. If you remember, yeah. purchase pipelines were were taking forever only because all their all their personnel, all their underwriters and staff were trying to to go through all the refinance applications, and and everything was get, becoming a hot mess. And pe- it they weren't expecting it to to go the way it did. And so, of course, you've got a lagging period of hiring and getting those people up to speed. And just like this right now is is the refinance they. They didn't fire quick enough yeah. to to offload that excess fat that they had during the refinance boom that they hired to. And these companies that, again, when they just go and sell on the cheapest rate possible, their margins are a lot less. Yep. And so they're not making as much profit. So they don't have a lot of operating capital probably in the first place. And so, you know, it's it's... I'm going to tell you right now, if you have a client that is supposed to close tomorrow and all of a sudden that loan, that lending institution shut down and now they've got to go back and find another place and now it's kicked them out two, three, four weeks and they plan to move in. They had, you know, mover set. They had everything going on. I guarantee you they wouldn't give a shit about the rate at that moment. A hundred percent. And that's, is this the natural ebb and flow of things, right? The, the reason that uh, lenders were hiring so many people for the last couple of years during COVID is because like you got to think about what was important to clients right when rates are like sub three then a small variation in rate really doesn't matter to the buyer what matters is that i'm working with a lender that's going to help me get the deal done and compete with the other 50 offers that are on the table so what really mattered was the ability to close quickly right and that means you got to staff more so you guys you got to have you got to be able to service your pipeline and then the refi business on top of that which is massive so you had to hire a whole bunch of people to service both sides the purchase and the refinance side now the refinance side has completely disappeared and the purchase side is becoming more about rates than it is about speed to close and things like that and so you're, you're just not needing to staff as many people and of course you'll always have outliers that just flat out go out of business because they probably just didn't manage their finances yeah, well when, when things were good it's crazy because that's how COVID felt I remember like once COVID hit there were restaurants that like literally like as soon as everybody was forced to shut down two weeks later they were just out of business yeah and it was Dude. like the vendor trucks weren't even showing up anymore more with freaking vegetables because like you just you were that close to the edge all already the, all the time but think about yeah. this like yeah. harvey talks about he's like the webinar space is interesting yeah. and, and you know this is the one thing that you know we're we you know because mortgage mike is a great sponsor of the show is like we wanted to be how can we help him get to direct to consumers mm-hmm. because the agents are are kind of they're 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 muffing the kick on this one yeah right and and whoa and and they're not helping the lenders yeah either in this in this situation they're actually making it worse in my opinion and so you know i was talking we were talking with mortgage mike like what can we do to provide a webinar that can go direct to consumers also great for agents yeah. and then we can marry it together and create something of value and that's what coach burt talks about is like you know he he says the problem in any sales organization and industry and he said especially in real estate is is when people do follow up they're like hey matt just going to follow up you have any questions well, no, I don't have any fucking questions. Okay, well, I'll call you next month. Yep, see if you have any so questions t- then. Tell me where there's value in that. There's not. There's, you're, what are you doing? You're just, you're, you're, you know, yes, you're going to convert people that way. Because trust me, we, we are guilty of this all day long. And like, just call them. Even if you don't have anything to say, just call them and say, hey, just touch and base. Yeah. Or, or Coach Bird, you know, and this really resonated because this is some trainers that have talked and some gurus have, you know, thought about this and, and, and advise people to say this. He's like, Hey, uh, Matt, I woke up thinking about you. Just wanted to call you. And he's like, is that not weird? Bro, I got to admit, I'll sell myself off on this. I've got a little piece of automation right now going out that sounds just like that shit. And hearing somebody else say it out loud, it is total trash. And I've got to fix that right now. <laughs> In the shower this morning, think about you, Matt. It doesn't, it doesn't. It's not quite that creepy, but it's definitely not. It's not genuine, and you there's know, no value. And I will tell you, look, there's something, especially in the coach world, and yeah. the the this, you know, there's a lot of just bullshit coaches out there. And I, I, look, go look him up, Coach Burt, Coach Michael Burt, um, and he he's. 
was, everything I that he's done. First time was Bert. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. But if you go look at it, his sales team, I'm going to tell you right now, they follow, they practice what they preach when it comes to follow up. Yep. It is, hey, you know, back to the basics. Here's what I'll do. Back to the basics on every, how to everything prove your business. Number one, lead generate every single day. Like Brian said, three out. We say three hours a day, four hours a day, right? Three to four hours a day. You're right. It needs to be eight hours because this is your full time job. This is what you do for right? a living. You should have a focused effort for at least several hours a day. Three like- hours a day. You adding new people into your pipeline. Um, he's got a whole book called you know the the million dollar follow up that talks about you know building out your farm list, your hit list. Um, going after blue marlins. Who's a blue marlin? Blue yeah. marlins are the big, like those are the whales. Yep. Um, and and in this, it's it's you know when you're when you're talking to people and you get off of having a conversation, go send them if you want to connect with them, send them a video message. Yep. You know, that's something that that Matt did really really well. He did automate this later, but he did really well with the birthday things of yep. sending video Facebook messaging to that. That is huge, right? The next thing is is staying consistent so one thing that we are we're training our team on to stay consistent is especially when when this this can be a trying market number one thing i said first off to to our agents i told them yesterday i said guys there's a lot of fear in this marketplace i'm going to tell you right now you need to be excited the reason being over the last two years you had needed zero skill to seem like you're a rock star in this industry yep and one thing that we've done really, really well is that we've trained you how to, to have the skill and the knowledge to win, yep. right? And, and we're over here. I said, you need, to, you need to be calling buyers, and you need to be excited yeah. and saying, hey, Brian, have you heard the great news? Have you heard the great news about what's going on right now in the, in the marketplace? No. Oh, you haven't? I haven't. Well, look. You know, the last couple of years, trying to buy a home has absolutely been insane. It's been a I'm, beating. I'm sure you've heard about that, right? Oh, yeah. yeah I tried. Yeah. It, was, it was terrible. Yeah. And you know what the great news is? That's no longer the case anymore. In fact, we're help, we, we just helped the client get, get uh, a home under contract, 10000 under asking price. Really? And so, look, I understand what you're going to say, Brian, more than likely, is look, interest rates are a little high. They're higher than they were, absolutely. You're 100% correct. But there's two things that, that are going on right now. Right now, it's looking like uh, appreciation rates are going to be a, still up about 8.5%. So we still have some, some runway left in that appreciation. Yeah. You know, so we'll get you into a house, get you out of renting. Your first-time home buyer, great time to be a first-time home buyer in this marketplace. Oh, yeah, so, leverage. Yeah, you don't, have to, you don't have to. Do you have $100,000? No, Good? I don't. Oh, okay, no, great. Um, so you don't have to have a $100,000 down payment. We can get you in right now for 3.5%. What? What is there a way I get my interest rate lower possibly? Uh-huh. That's great. I don't know how you were leading me to that, Brian, but absolutely <laughs> we can figure out we have great ways with mortgage Mike or he's our he's our you know, they call him the best of the best when it comes to loan officers here in Texas and in Oklahoma now. He just got licensed in Oklahoma. Did you hear about that, Brian? I, I didn't hear about that. Yeah. I was thinking about buying a home there too. Yeah. So, you know, you know, Mortgage Mike is a big UT fan. And it took a lot for him to get licensed in Oklahoma. He does not like Oklahoma. So that tells you how great it is to buy a house right now, Brian. And so from that, absolutely, there could be some ways that we could get this seller to contribute some money to to buy your interest rate down. Or you could use it to maybe save a little bit of uh, out-of-pocket cash from from your closing. But what I would love to do, do you have time tomorrow to do a Zoom call or come into my office to just do a quick overview on on the home buying process? Oh, 100% I can. Okay, let's do the sell side now. (laughs) <laughs> hey Brian, have you heard oh, how I was going to be the one? Have you heard how shitty the market is no. right now? Exactly. Hey <laughs> Nick, have you heard the? You're the tenth caller you heard the good today. News about our Lord and Savior. No, <laughs> <laughs> I had a conversation with an expired this morning, and it was just is it in South Lake. So I always use that I grew up there as like an inn, like anyone gives a shit. Like, do you um, know me? Yeah, I was like, so so what kept you from or you know what, what's the reason you don't want to put it back on the market? Well, the the you know the market's just falling apart. It's crappy now. Right, they were listed for eight fifty, and they couldn't sell, so they canceled. Right, and I was like, "Well, let me ask you, wh- when did you buy the home?" So it's four years ago. Four years ago, I was like, "What did you, you pay for the home?" Six hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, something like that. I said, "Well, well let, me, let me ask you. In two thousand eighteen, if I had told you that you could sell this home for eight hundred thousand dollars in two thousand twenty-two, would that seem like a win for you?" Yeah, absolutely. Cool. I could probably sell your home for eight hundred thousand dollars today. <laughs> Do you still think it's a bad time to sell your home? Right, like. Wasn't that abrupt about it, but that was one of my two yeah. great conversations today that I have a follow up with on Monday. All you're doing Hopefully is. Hopefully, you sent a video text message after that. Brian. I did. Okay, good. And um, 
I with, mean, this with is those what, glasses on? With these glasses They on, look a little dirty. They are dirty. These are not even prescription. <laughs> these are my blue blockers. I've been getting, man, I, sp- I stare at a blue screen all day, and it makes my eyeballs hurt. So I've been starting to wear the blue blockers to the office a little more just to protect my vision. I like it. It looks good. Somehow they still say I have 20-20 vision every year, which seems like it's not real. I kind of feel like I'm getting Truman showed every time. Yeah. They're like, I'm like, I can't read any of that. Like, you know, you're 20-20. But, but you, dude, you're 100% correct, though, is of yeah. – of, if if you bought that home in 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 2017 and, yeah. and two years later you could sell it for 150 thousand more, you're I, telling me? I said this at team meeting yesterday. We are in a very unique time in the marketplace where buyers are gaining leverage, but they're not doing it at the expense of sellers. Meaning, yeah, it'd be great to sell your home for 850 after four years. Fucking awesome, you know? It'd be great if a genie flew out of my butt and gave me four wishes, but that's probably not going to happen, right? Like. But if you bought at 625 in 2018, you're selling for $800,000 now, that's a win. So a buyer can use leverage, meaning they have negotiating power now, to probably get a home at a, at a lower price than they would have if, if prices kept accelerating the way they were. And sellers have more equity than they've ever had before. So all we're doing is reverting to the mean. This is, an, this is a reversion to the average, right? We're in a very unique space where buyers can get what they want and sellers are still making out like bandits. It's fantastic. And you know how do you... You use that to your advantage to find the opportunity in this market. I said this, I've been saying this to our team forever. Have more conversations, have better conversations. That's all you need to know to everything proof your business right now. Eat is less a, food. Eat less food, right? Eat. Mostly, pl- no. Right? Like, <laughs> it, it, is, it is a contact sport. Have more damn conversations every day. We call it, I call it, we call it the politician. It is, and you're, right? just, you're, you're in just, campaign mode, right, Brian? Exactly. So, and you're just, having different, you're just having conversations with different people. Try having a conversation with an expired six months ago. There weren't any, and they expired for a reason. They weren't the people you wanted to be talking to. Now, they are a dime a dozen. And they need to hear from people like you that know what you're talking about. So have more conversations, have better conversations. And by the way, the best way to have better conversations is to have more conversations. <laughs> you're gonna get better at them. I, I have been giving people on our team and our organization my ultimate permission to fail for a long time now. And I hope that you give yourself permission to as well. There is just no agent out there I, I, I really love this about, um, you know, uh, Derek Lipsky. Yes. Expired, dude. Yep. I, I grew up like he's like, uh, dude, he's like a member of Wu-Tang to me. I grew up on his shit. And, Him uh, and Colton Lindsay. Yeah, right. hundred yeah. percent. And I have seen that dude screw up so many conversations on the phone because he just has so many conversations. But they don't all go well. They're not listening. And as we get a little now we have a little bit more time next time we do y'all do some calls let's let's actually do this 30 day prospecting that we talked Dude, about never i would have so much fun with it i would have fun with it i want to share a story about something that that was awesome that i think kind of speaks to that that call thing right so so harvey holmes com- commented before he's he's a he's an amazing partner of ours and he was never really a prospecting based guy and he has gotten into the fizbo game really really hard now he's gone on like four Fizbo previews over the last week or so, just literally calling Fizbo's going on previews. That's it. Out of those four, one listed with him, just went under contract today, pre-market. We didn't even do photos. It is fucking possible, people. Just have conversations, have more conversations, and have better conversations. Like, anybody can do this. He's going to be one of the people that are still standing 120 days from now when the amount of available income matches the amount of agents that are still working and everything goes back to normal in our world. This is a four-month shift. After, at the market's still going to – there's still going to be fewer homes sold in 2023 than sold in 2022 and sold in 2021. But as far as our intents and purposes, it's a 120-day shift because in 120 days, you're only going to have the amount of agents still working and still fighting that lines up with the amount of available deals and available income. Plain and simple. That's, that's what's up. Hey, Matt. Hey, Brian. Have you heard why it's a great time to be a real estate agent right now? I don't know, Nick. Why? Because – Remember during the run-up over the last two years mm-hmm. when OfferPad and Open Door Ooh. were over there kicking everyone's ass? I, th- I didn't even think about this. Well, that's not happening anymore. Mm-hmm. Being nope. a real, the stock value of being a, a good real estate consultant, a good real estate professional, is at an all-time high. Yeah. The stock market may be in the tank, but the value of being a good real estate professional is not. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I will tell you, in fact, I was with Brian on Monday, right? And I'm like, hey, I just got an open, you know, I like to play the open door 
numbers. Yeah, I love it. So Open Door originally offered me 588000 I believe, okay. and some change for my house. So they said, hey, you got a new updated offer. It expired. So we refreshed it, and it dropped by basically, let's just round up, because just to make it easy, it dropped by $100,000. Yeah. yeah. Right? Another, another friend of mine who, who likes to play with Open Door is toying around with his dad's home, and he texted me at the same time. He's like, hey, Open Door just lowered their offer by $40,000. And what that should tell you, right, and if you're going to educate yourself on this, which this should tell you is that the iBuyer technology companies don't look in the past. They're looking 90 to 100 days, 120 days in the future. And we have a client right now that was under contract with, with OfferPad. Everything was going well. And then all of a sudden, week before closing or maybe a week and a half, they come back and say, hey, we got a surprise for you. Mm -hmm. We want to lower our offer by $80,000. You know what? This is fun. Let's just do this. Let's start a fucking war. Sylvan did this shit to us. Open Doors done this shit to us. Offer Pads done this shit to us. Fuck you guys. So we said, you know, I, we're like, hey, why? I hope we get sued over that. No, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Brian Force only, please. I've dealt with enough already. Um, and we were like, hey, why? And they're like, this is the number we need to be at to resell it. And so, Woo! yeah. just had I don't know who Facebook user yeah. is, but man, that is intense. Yeah. So your stock value of being a real estate professional, do you think, by the way, when Open Door lowers their offer, OfferPad lowers their offer, is there going to be clients that still take that? Yes. Yeah, the yes, some. Yeah, sure. One hundred percent. They're not. Yeah, they're not going out of business. So their market share will shrink. The point of that is when Brian's making those expire calls, and they're like, "Hey, we were at eight hundred fifty thousand, and we didn't sell. The market's going to shit." Yeah. And you're like, "Hey, if I could sell for eight hundred, would if I could have sold it for eight hundred thousand two years after you bought it, would that have been a win?" Well, yeah. Well, I can sell for eight hundred now. Great. So you're finding the solution, right? Money changes hands when problems are solved. One hundred percent. A hundred percent. That is actually a point. I'm sorry to mean that's, no, that's no, a point can't. that I didn't even really think about. Is that, is that when we're talking about the amount of available income per agent? Understand there are a lot of forces at play right now. Yes, there are going to be agents that get out of the business, and that's that's going to be more uh, more deals per agent for those of us who are less standing. Also, how many deals have we lost to institutional buyers whose only real uh, value that they've brought into the marketplace is convenience? Like that's going uh, the the market the amount of market share. The amount of deals that are done by institutional buyers where an agent didn't even really have a chance to be involved, that is going to shrink. That's more available deals for actual professionals. And to that end, this may be where you're going. How what percentage of cancels today when we were calling were from discount brokers? There were there was a there was a very obvious um, theme in the in the canceled space this morning. Listing spark, listing spark. It was it was spark. a lot it was a lot of very, very similar names that like in the past have always been like um, probably people's go-to, and I will tell you, of the two conversations I had were both with with that were canceled with a previous, I would say, discount style broker, right? Like I don't yeah. ever want to like like they, like there was there was still a full service broker. There it wasn't like these were like shitty pictures, text no, text me for that. stuff, but it was they, like you could tell there was definitely and they, they ejected flat quick. fee. Yeah, they ejected right. pretty quick from that, and so I don't know. It was it was interesting. I think we're still seeing a lot more of that. You know what I'm interested to see when we talk about this is that uh, we'll do it on a show in the next couple of weeks. Is the the commission lawsuits are pop back up? Oh, is that flaring up again? Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, geez. Eight homeowners have filed another. Have in come what, forward. What state? I don't. I didn't read it all, but it's it's basically it's refueling that commission. Net. I guess I don't understand. I don't want to spend a ton of time on this. We talk about. I don't understand the lawsuit because commissions were never fixed. It's actually illegal to even talk about yep. commissions being fixed. You can lose your license over that. So what is the suit? I don't know. And and there a lot of these are buyers that are complaining about it. But at the same time, if these buyers had to go pay for their own commission or they had to go pay an agent or yeah. build it into a loan. I don't think that they truly understand the the future repercussions that it could cause. They do, I mean, we 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 do that. Do you guys under? Oh my gosh, we do this with other assets. We do this with car loans. 
you you build the lender's commission into your car loan. You understand that, right? When you usually when you finance through the dealership and things like that, like, and that's a smaller asset. It, it would really make an affordability, a short term affordability problem if we did it for for highly leveraged assets like homes, which cost exponentially more than cars, right? Like. I just I don't I don't understand the suit because the suit, in my understanding, what I vaguely knew about is it was a price fixing suit. But that's not how real estate commissions have ever worked. They've always been negotiable. So I just I guess I don't understand what grounds on which we're doing this. Whatever. Jesse, give us something good. What was the one you had before? Would you if you could take a pill that oh, made yeah. you not require sleep, would you take it? <laughs> don't they already have that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they got a few. No, I would not take that. You don't think so? No, dude, I don't want to take that. Like one. So you sleep for pleasure? Yeah, dude, I mm. love waking up in the morning <laughs> with no alarm clock, and then what the hell? It's like somebody Whoa. got a record scratch yeah. on me. DJ Showalter. Um, I love waking up in the morning with the sun coming through the window and just getting woken. Like there is no better way to wake up than on vacation in a perfect bed with I the sun waking you up. That's true because the it's cynic, dope. the cynic exactly. in me, the cynic exactly. in me always <laughs> imagines these in like the worst possible scenario because like. My mind goes to like your body. It says it removes your body's need for sleep. Yes. Does it does it remove the sensation of being tired? Because there would be nothing worse than being tired all the time all and the not time, being able yeah. to sleep. That would be horrible. I don't know. There's something about just coming and crashing. Well, and you can't so turn your mind, and you don't get to turn your mind off. Yeah, you never get a break. I yeah. guess I don't want to take that pill. No, I'm I also have so much more time for activities. Maybe so much time to do stuff. Think I about guess, think I, about how much wine we could drink. That's yeah. true. That's the, true. The well, next Jesse, one's I've kind seen of, you do that. What are you talking yeah, about? It's true. <laughs> more. I said more. <laughs> the next one's interesting only because I know my I like it says would you rather uh, would you rather have to say anything that comes to your mind all the time or never have to or never have to say anything at all. I, as much as I wouldn't want whatever pops in my mind to be out there, the idea that I couldn't talk at all is just horrifying. So I'm just yeah. going to roll with whatever pops in my mind is out there for public consumption. Because eventually the shock would wear up. Be like, They'd be like, oh, that's, that's, just, that's just Kelderman. That's just Kelderman. I think where my mind goes to is like, I definitely think there'd be a lot of repercussions for me saying what I'm thinking all the time. And I've also, I mean, I've seen John Wick. So I think you could do pretty well by never talking yeah. either. Like, I think you could do this whole Mysterioso thing and get away with it. And I feel like if I said what I meant all the time, or what I was thinking all the time, people would have a much lower opinion of me. Fun fact, if you had told me that John Wick uh, involved silence at all, I wouldn't know because I've never watched any of those shows. Well, really? Wow. You need to go Is watch that just because you haven't gotten around to it or you have some I don't like taking on new shows, man. It's I, not it's a show. Like, it's no, a it's movie. I movies too. I just, I just don't want to waste my like, – I'd, I'd prefer to waste my time doing dumber crap. See, mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. It took me almost – how long has the new season of Obar Ozark been out? Like a year? I just started it, and everybody's been telling me to. But I can't I get stopped it watching it because it's, it's too not, much, yeah. man. Yeah, dude, it's, I'm I just all on one with those artists. It's, it's too great. much. It's yeah. too much. It's so. I much. think sometimes people just act like they like shows because, because everybody else, else tells does. them. Guess what else? Right? Like, like there's so many shows that are just not that great. Oh, what's right? the? Oh, this is a good question. This should be our question. What's like the most overrated Over. show Oof. that people say is good? Dude, I mean, what, this is going to fall on deaf ears for probably the majority of our audience, but Seinfeld is garbage. You don't like I it? Agree. No. I, agree. I think Seinfeld. I, I also don't think that's that hot of an opinion. I think there's plenty of people who are annoyed by Seinfeld. Yeah, yeah they my, are. My I think I'd take more it. heat if I said, like, The Wire was trash. Friends was trash. See, yeah, I just that I just I just watched it all. Like the, Friends was the show I watched, whether I was sad or happy. I think or, Friends was perfect in its time. It was yeah. It was I, like I, I did not watch it at I all. I also could I see how it was overrated. Like, I think uh, I think that I thought The Wire was pretty decent. Did you guys ever watch like um, uh, Oz and shit like that? No, no. I didn't. No. I will tell I saw you some episodes of. I want to watch The Sopranos again. When I first watched it. That holds up. I thought it was pretty good. Brian, what show are you watching? I wasn't what, like. What show are you watching right now? I wasn't are you, out. Are you still watching it? What am I? Wait, what Didn't is Didn't you it? start watching Sex and the City just recently? Oh, I finished oh, yeah. it. Did you? I finished Sex and the City and movies. both movies. And it's fantastic. <laughs> so I didn't watch. Uh, I watched the first episode of uh, and then uh, and, and just like that, uh, the new one. And it's not that good. But, will, bro, I'm going to tell you right now. I'm a, this is why I like Friends. I'm a sucker for New York in the 90s. You put anybody in New York and Manhattan in the <laughs> 90s, I just think it's such a pure, beautiful time to be alive. Sex and the City is a good show, bro. The movies aren't as good. The show, 
It's pretty fucking good, dude. The movie. It's pretty good, man. They did the same yeah. thing with Transformers. That is to make it into a movie. Dude, yeah. garbage, no, dude. I love Transformers. Transformers is the shit, but yeah. the movie was no. The not movies good. were great. I love all they my killed movie. Optimus. I like some. I like some back. of the. Yeah, no, they did. No, I like so some. Of I just the think there's so much content now. Like a lot of the things that I think are overrated are just stuff that people watch because it's hot right now. Like. I watched one episode of Squid Games. I don't no, even awesome. know yeah. what no, that man. was. Nope, I didn't watch it. It's trash. It's an absolute trash. There's like a lot of stuff like that that I really think I'm watching is, that new Chris Pratt show on Amazon Prime. Oh, yeah, the one where he's like a real Special Forces yes. badass. Oh, and, yeah. and, and, you don't know what's, that. and you don't know what's real and what's not. I've heard is it's it real good? Good, gory, dude. Yeah, I like it's pretty gory good. stuff. Yeah, yeah. I'm going so to have check that out. I'm Victoria and I have been watching Umbrella Academy on Netflix. Okay, so love is that I will tell you, it took, I love me, it. it took me a couple episodes to get rolling. We're deep into season two, and I jam with it. It's all over the fucking place. Oh, dude, it's everywhere. I, two, two things about the show. I think everybody who acts in there shows emotion on a level that, like, honestly is okay. disturbingly good yeah. because there's a lot of, like, really, yeah. like, kind of yeah. dark stuff happening. And, and, and there's a couple of characters who... Whoever's writing for them is a genius because it's funny yeah. as hell. Huh. So I, 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 it's a weird show though. I would I would definitely be open to something like that. You're not gonna like this, but but I think anything with superpowers is super overrated. I just that goes for movies too. Yeah, I think I, like Harry, that, I think so. Harry Potter sucks. I think all the Avengers stuff sucks. I'm not Avengers on, I'm is great. Not, I'm not up on Harry Potter. I'm not, I've tried no. grinding through. Harry I'm gonna tell Potter. you right now. Like I have no disrespect for people that do like Harry Potter because I know a lot, even people in this room. I was just like late it. to it. Jesse's wife is a huge Harry oh, Potter huge. fan. Yeah. And you can say all the stuff that I like is dumb and I won't be offended. I just think Harry Potter's dumb, dude. I, I just think never, it's dumb. I was late to the party. By the time I came around to it, there were so many of them out. The, yeah. Even like, just like the cinematic graphics of the first one, I was like, nah, shit's just better. Like Harry this Potter? Yeah. yeah, I don't want Like my little cars thing. floating up in the window yeah. in the very first yeah, one, like whatever. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. I'm already out of this. Like, <laughs> this doesn't look like something <laughs> I care about. Yeah. I'm not, but see, oh my gosh, maybe that's it. Do you guys want to know what the most overrated show is of all time? It's a very hot opinion. Because Game of Thrones isn't that good. I just don't think... <sighs> no, it was good in the poorly. beginning. Yeah. It, when they were based on uh, George R. R. Martin's the actual, novels, like, they were books good. or whatever. Yeah. When they had to create their own shit. I, I could get. I, I liked trash. it, but I could get down with that opinion. Like, I think I mean, like, it's... For me, it's anything from that time period. I, I won't remember I Game think, of Thrones when I'm seven. I think what that. it is is no. I just think that like it was such a dirty time and people smelled and everything was always... Yeah. Gross oh, everybody like, smelled, yeah. dude. I just don't like watching content from those time periods because you so gross to me what people smelled like oh god dude because i've said that about movies it's <laughs> like terrible god. i will tell you right now and this is my dad's gonna hate this like movies are the same way there are a lot of movies you watch that are just not that good monty python and the holy grail it's not like it no it's no. Only i like agree a, i yeah. agree it's Look, not people horrible been, people have been doing bits forever it's with not this. horrible it's just not that great no. i agree i agree it's fine it's totally fine like we're on the, minute the, 63. Uh, yeah. I think this should just be the podcast. Yeah. Let's just yeah. do hot opinions about, you know, and people are still watching. Yeah. Yeah. And what's wrong with all of that? I can't believe are nobody's still watching. Chimed oh, in. Now they're leaving. We where's, have a lot where's of the opinions Ron? about real estate, but yeah. nobody cares about my game of Thrones, you know, hot, hot take. take. <laughs> ah, jinx. Yeah. <laughs> Baker Mayfield's going to do fine in Carolina. All right. He's I have a showing trash. in a little bit. Get us out of here. Well, let's, I still got work to do. Armadillo dot one backslash tour for the Ron home warranty. You got Mortgage Mike of Texas, the best loan officer in Texas, and now Oklahoma. And homeward. Do you think he would wear an Oklahoma Sooner shirt? He would do the bit that super fans do where they act like it burns their skin. And it's like, dude, it's just a shirt. Shut up and put it on. Let's do this. He would totally do that. He would pretend like it's... The first new client from the show, he has to wear an OU shirt. Yes. That's a good... uh, One, I forgot to answer this before. We need to try and get Coach Bird on. Two. Yes. This is a good hypothetical. How much fireball do you think the backer would have to drink oh my to God, dude. accidentally put on an Oklahoma Sooners jersey? He'd have to be passed out. I would say 52 <laughs> fireballs in a row. All right. Five-star reviews. Go over to the Facebook group, the only real estate group worth being a part of. And uh, get us out of here, please. I got to go show <laughs> Thanks for watching the show today. Make sure if you're watching this on Facebook, you head over to our group, the only real estate group we're being a part of, so you can watch the extended conversation. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. And if you listen on the Apple Podcast, leave us a review. We'd really like it. So just do it. Do it. Do that over there. Go to this one. Then go to that one. Thanks.